Welcome to Freedom Church. You're about to watch part 10 of our current series, Discipleship Uncomplicated. If you're new, we want to meet you and we want to send you a gift. So text that number down below. And if this podcast has impacted you in any way and you'd like to give, there's two ways that you can do so. You can head to freedom.church slash give or you can text Freedom Church, all one word, to the number 77977. So listen, um, I want to get into the Word of God this morning. But before we do, is, is anybody here love Christmas time? I mean, I mean, love everything about it. I love the parties. I love the food. I love the gathering of friends. I love shopping. I love shopping. I love shopping. Come on, somebody. I love shopping. I love everything about it. I love the parking lot wars. You know what I'm talking about? With, with Daniel, where you know that's your parking spot, your blink is on, you're sitting there in the aisle waiting and some knucklehead shoots in, oh, we got to talk about that. Come on, y'all. Like, like I'm, I'm from the hood. That's, like, you can't, come on, man, you know what's up. So I love all of that. I also love giving gifts. How many, how many gift givers do I have here? Like, like not, not like, I, lo- I love to give good gifts. The only problem is, is I don't know how to wrap them very well. And, and, and about the only thing, I'll come back to that in a second, about the only thing I don't love about this time of year is that my wife forces me to watch endless hours of the Hallmark Channel. Like all of the husbands in here, we're going to start a support group called Men Against the Hallmark Channel. Come on. We're going to start a small group. Come on. And me and you, we charter members. My wife, man, anything cheesy and corny, she loves. Come on, y'all. I need something to blow up. I need to shoot somebody. I need CIA involved. I mean, I need the world to be coming to an end, and I jump in it with a gun and save the world. That's my idea of Christmas. I don't know what yours is. Back to the point, I, I love wrapping gifts. I, I, lo- I love buying gifts. I hate wrapping them. I don't know about you, but before I even leave the mall, I find some little high school group, some church group to wrap it because my wife drives me nuts because she can put, now, come on, ladies, watch this. She can make the, you know, the little angle and the little angle, fold it up, put the tape on it. I can't do any of that. I just hand it to you. It's all mangled here. But inside, but here's the problem. If you judge my gift by the wrapping, you will miss the blessing that's inside of it. And and I would say to you that part of the problem we have in our lives oftentimes is the gifts that God gives us oftentimes come in suspect packaging. Jesus, and indeed, I'm going to get to you and I in a minute, but isn't it true that Jesus is a strangely wrapped gift to humanity? I mean, think about it. If you are going to bring a savior into the world, he is going to overthrow the power of darkness and save humanity and give new life and break the power of darkness that, that, that you would expect that he would come with pomp and circumstance, like, like, like he would come like Maximus in the gladiator, with, like on a horse with his sword going around. And he's bringing, listen, the nation of Israel have waited decades, in fact, hundreds of years, waiting for a promised Messiah who had been prophesied that he would come, that he would throw off tyranny. And here the Jews were living underneath Roman occupation, harsh taxation. They were oppressed. They did not have sovereign independence as a nation. And here somebody said, your king has come. And so they start looking for him. And the three wise men and everybody, everybody's looking to hear this word. Angels are declaring it. And it's a baby. Come on, somebody. I mean, if you were waiting for deliverance, you were looking around, you wouldn't have looked in a, wait a minute, by the way, he was born in a manger, in a stable, among animals, and in in swaddling clothes, and wait a minute, this is not what we were expecting. This is a strangely wrapped gift. Not to mention his conception is suspect. It's a virgin born of a womb, yes, sure. Born of the spirit he is, yeah, I bet. Even Joseph was like, I don't know about all this, but I'm, I'm a good dude, so, you know, like, I don't want to divorce Mary and make her, you know, look funny. So I'm going to just put her away quiet. God said, no, that's, that's the Savior. Strangely wrapped gift. Come on. By the way, he's not from Jerusalem. Did you know that? Jerusalem is the city of kings, fought over Christians, Muslims, and Jews, have fought over the capital city of Jerusalem. In fact, it's still a bone of contention in geopolitics even now. And so, so he's not from Jerusalem. He's from Nazareth, like this out of the way, Daniel, this out of the way place, impoverished, kind of like if you told somebody you're from Chatsworth. <laughs> I, I'm not trying to hate on you, I'm just saying, 
Like when you tell somebody you're from LA, where you from? It's like, I'm from LA. You know, you say, I'm from NYC, I'm from New York. And, and you roll up and you're like, where you from? The cuz? You're like, I'm from Chatsworth. You know what I'm saying? It's a little different. You know what I'm saying? It's a little different. You go over the hill, people from LA, Hollywood side, you know, Santa Monica. You, you don't understand. So he's from Nazareth. And it's just weird. It's not, it's not what you would expect. Nothing about him is what you would expect. He is a strangely wrapped gift. Say, say out loud, it's strange. But he is the savior of the world. He came to bring new life. Come on, somebody. How many of you have new life in Christ? Give the Lord a hand clap right now. Come on. But so are you. You're a strangely wrapped gift. In fact, I don't know whether you realize it or not, but you're a gift to your family, you're a gift to your kids, you're a gift to your neighbors, your cousins, you're a gift to this church. You're indeed a gift to the world. You're a gift. In fact, can I go further? You're an answer to prayer to somebody. That when you step up at work with the gospel in your life, turned on for Jesus, that you tell your story. And, and you're a gift to someone. You're an answer to prayer. You're an encouragement to somebody. You're lifting somebody up just by you showing up. Oh, it's too quiet in there. That was a good place to say amen. If I was at a black church, they'd be shouting me down. You jokers sitting there like y'all crazy. Come on, holler at me. I throw this mic and run out of here. You're a gift. You're a gift. So God chose you as a gift to be used to put on display. He's a trophy of grace. He wants to show you. How many know you wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for grace? Grace, come on, wave at me, wave at me. Grace people, grace people. I give you 10 seconds to give the God a shout for the grace on your life right now. For the grace on your life. For the grace that he gave you. For the forgiveness that he gave you. How many know you in your right mind right now, not because of drugs, but because of the Holy Spirit, that God empowered you? How many know you threw off addiction, not because of steps, but because of Jesus? Come on, come on. So, so, so the God who doesn't need anything or anybody who, who can create with the word of his mouth. He can create everything. And he chose you to be a gift that he wanted to give you away, even as a young guy. He wanted to give you away, even in your old age, in your middle age, wherever you are, black, white, skinny, educated, uneducated. You're like, but you don't know me. I don't, but God does. And he chose you. I'm chosen. I'm chosen. And you say, but, but how can God use somebody like me and why? Don't, don't you understand that the God that we serve, he finds broken things irresistible. And, and you might say this morning, I have issues. You, you don't know me. You don't know what I'm wrestling with this morning. I don't, but the God of heaven does. In fact, the God of heaven knew you before you knew you. Come on, somebody. Before your mother and your daddy got in that back seat and did what they did, God knew you. Are you hearing me? The Bible said in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4, he said, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Intimate knowledge. I, I knitted you together, Psalms 139 says. He knit you. Come on, somebody. And he told, he told Jeremiah, I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. That's before he ever done anything. That was in his mother's womb. Before he got a chance to get addicted, before he got a chance to get divorced or whatever thing you got that you're struggling with. Because I mean, no, it's all in the room right now. He chose you. He chose. So, so when God gets ready to choose somebody, what kind of characteristics and qualifications are he, is he looking for? Let, let me give it to you. First uh, Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Just listen to this. Let, let, me, let me see if you can catch it. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that... Few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. So, so you're saying, I, I, can, I, can, it, can I say it like I want to say it? The things that you think disqualify you actually are qualifying marks. 
your weakness, your inconsistency. Come on, somebody. Your inability to get anything done. You say, I'm weak. I'm struggling. I, I don't know what to do. I, 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 all of the problems that you have and all of the struggles you have. And God says, I like that. I chose you. I want to use you. You know why? Because you are the ones that when God uses and you're not leaning on your gifts and your power and all of that stuff, when God uses it, you're the one that return the glory back to God. You're the ones that'll say, if it had not been for God who was on my side, I would have perished. Come on, somebody. How many know it's God? But God did it. Say, but God. No, no, say, but God. God was rich in mercy that when I was dead and my sins and trespasses, he chose me, called me. Come on, y'all not, not getting this. I feel this thing. I'm preaching a lot harder than you, amen, and that's for sure. <laughs> he chose foolish, powerless things, despised things, things that aren't anything at all. So, so the people that you walk by on the street sometimes, God said, I chose them. Don't you know that God can take a man right now that's living underneath one of these bridges with a shopping cart and an imaginary friend and touch him by the spirit of the Lord and make him stand on this stage and preach better than any of us could preach. God chooses the weak things. Why? So that he would get the glory. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. So then it might be said that all of us are strangely wrapped gifts. Look around right now. Look at somebody. Tell them, you strange. Tell them right now. I mean, you're strange. You're a strangely wrapped gift. You're a gift. There are gifts all over this room. There's gifts, gifts all over the room. There are gifts all behind the scenes and places you don't even see right now. Gifts are being used. You came in here and gift. You walked in to people that had prepared a place by using their gifts. And they don't feel like they're strong or qualified or, or, or got enough education or enough theology. The only thing is, is they're available. Come on, somebody. And they say, they say God, if you want to love me, God, if you want to choose me, God, if you want to use me, then do it. Here, here's the challenge. That, that was said once that if you don't know a purpose for a thing, then abuse is inevitable. So if you don't know the purpose for a thing, abuse is inevitable. So if you don't know what your life is for, then you'll use it for anything. You'll go anywhere, do anything. You know, young people, that's why it's important for you as parents to raise up kids with purpose and identity in Christ so that they won't run around and do everything else like a mockingbird, picking up the song of everybody, every group that they're in and looking like everybody and walking like everybody, talking like everybody. Why? Because they're gifted and called and chosen by God for his purposes. And if you don't know what the purpose is for a thing, you will transgress its purpose. Many of you misuse your life even now because you don't yet know what your gifts are, your callings are. What, what is life about? And you look at all of the things that you see in our culture and in the world right now, and you just say, well, what's the use? The world's going to hell in a handbasket. What's the use? What's the reality? I mean, we got racial problems. We got black problems. We got white problems. We got sexual problems. We got all kinds of issues, economic issues. And you're like, well, what's the deal? I can't. God called you to be a solution, a part of the solution in our world right now. Come on. You're not, you're not called, listen, you're not changing the world by sitting at home posting on Facebook and Twitter and doing your thing. You're not changing the world. You know when you change the world? When you get in the presence of God and say, God, you chose me. What did you choose me for? I didn't choose you so you can come to church every Sunday and sit here and applaud Justice and Maria every Sunday. They're not, they're not here. I know my babies. They're not here raising up a fan club to them. They're here raising up an army of people of God that would be mobilized to bring the good news of Jesus in practical and spiritual ways to a dying world. That's what we're a part of. And you get to be a part of it. And here's the challenge. Your story makes no sense until you plug your story in and find this place in the meta narrative that God is writing for the world. That's when your story starts making sense. That's when it makes sense in my life that I was born the way I was born and my mom thought she might abort me and, and went through rejection and abandonment from my dad and all that happened as he went to Vietnam for two tours and came home with PTSD and my story starts making a little more sense and, and then all of a sudden the immorality of my life and the perversion and the years that I was addicted to pornography and chased women and did all the things that I did and now all of a sudden somebody's calling me their pastor. Y'all calling me Big Papa now. They might have called me at one time in my life Big Pimpin'. Come on, somebody. Now they call me Big Papa because but God. Say but God. Y'all not talking to me. Come on, but God. 
Look at your neighbor and say, but God. God intervenes. God intervenes. God rewrites stories. God takes your story and rewrites it through his grace, and he wants to use you as a grace trophy. That's why you can't be ashamed of where you come from. You can't be, listen, 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 listen. You can't be ashamed of what you went through. You can't be ashamed of the abortions. You can't be, I said abortions. So you can't be ashamed to tell your story because your story will encourage and give life and hope to somebody who is despairing today. But the devil's got you, listen. So there's two strategies that I know of that the devil uses that remind me of a military strategy. So the first thing that the devil does is he tries to block you. Tries to block you. Stand up, my man, with the snap doing thing. Stand up for a second. Come up here with me. Come on, quick, quick. Come on, bro. I got you. So, so listen, you're trying to get by me. I'm not going to look. You look kind of tough. I'm tough, too. Let's not square off right now, okay? Your beard is better than my beard. I got beard envy. It's all good, okay? I like your haircut, too, bro, by the way. It's good stuff. It's fast as thing. You know what I'm saying? We got the same barber, right? So, so you're trying to get by me. Just ease up, okay? So go ahead and try to get by. So the devil just... He just blocks. He just blocks. You're trying to get to church. Your friends are inviting you to church, and you got too busy, and you think it's just because you're busy. It's not because you're busy. It's because he's trying to keep you away from house, the house of the Lord, because he knows if that word gets inside of you, it'll transform your life, your marriage, your kids, your generations. Then he wants to use you to transform your world. So he blocks you. Come on, keep coming. So he just blocks you. Come on, try to spin a little bit. Get sexy with it. Get sexy with it. And, and, he, and he's spinning and blocking you. And he's keeping you off that way. He doesn't want you to ever get exposed to the word. The word will liberate you. The word will free you up. The word will deliver you. The word will heal you. The word will restore you. That's why some of you, listen, you don't understand why daily devotions is necessary. Because if you understood it, you would be in the word of God every day. If you understood every time you sit in that word, you're exchanging something with God. And he's given something to you of him. And you're taking away all of that death and decaying from your life. Come on. So he blocks you. So once you come in. Once you come in, we can't do anything about it. Get your son up here. Come on, man. Jump up here. Stop being cool and get up here. Come on now. Come on. You're taking too long. Come on. You're taking too long. Okay, so then we're going to contain him. Okay, so now he came to the Lord, but we're not going to let him get free. Come on, stay here. Try to walk. Just try to walk. Stay in front of him, dog. Come on. We're staying around him. Come on, just get around him. Get around him. Get around him. So we're going to contain him. Why? Because we don't, he, we couldn't stop him from getting to the word. All right, y'all get off the stage. Y'all crazy. Come on. <laughs> Give them a big hand right now. First strategy, I got to block you. I don't want you to ever see the gospel. And then if you do see it, I'm going to contain you so that you never get free. I don't care if you go to Freedom Church. I just don't want you to ever get free. I want you to sing about songs that you don't live. I want you to say amen to things that you never walk in. I want you to be in church and be a good little church nerd. Come on, somebody. You know, praise the Lord, pastor. Praise the Lord. I love the church. I love the church. So what? The Bible says that God created good works for you to work, walk in. Ephesians 2 and 10 says that God created you for good works. What is the work that you're supposed to do and why aren't you doing it? You know why? Because the devil blocks you and he contains you. He contains you. He just keeps you, he, he don't mind you to have a little freedom just as long as you're not free indeed. As long as you're not completely set free. He don't mind. You come into church, get a little Jesus, get just enough Jesus. Watch this. Just to get you through the week, girl. Just to get you the next job. Get to hopefully get you married. And the devil's like, yeah, I'll just keep you all contained. Do you realize how many of you love Freedom Church? Okay. Do you understand that Freedom Church is not as good as it could be because we're not seeing every gift deployed, that some of the best gifts that, that could be used are not on the stage, are not on the cameras, are not in spaces right now because people are too busy, too occupied doing other things and they just don't have time. I'm busy. I just don't have time. You don't have time. What are you doing that has any significance to it, any eternal value to it other than what we are doing? What are you doing at work that's eternal? What are you doing in your neighborhood that's eternal? What are you doing at the soccer field when your kids are playing soccer? That's eternal. You can hijack all of that and force it to be an eternal thing, but until you understand and recognize that you were called for a purpose, that there's gifts and, and listen, callings down inside all of you. Justice has created this uncomplicated discipleship platform, and part of it is ministry gifts. 
and discovering your unique gifts. Some of you have extraordinary faith. Some of you have faith for miracles. Some of you have giving as a, as a miracle. Some of you have helps. You just want to help. Just want to help. I want to get behind. I want to be on the stage. My wife does not like the stage. My wife hates the stage. She would never. In fact, I have to make her get up sometimes. She doesn't want to do it. But you know what she does do? Local and global engagement. She loves seeing people served, resourced, equipped, education, health care. She fed 175,000 people last year. Give the Lord a big hand clap. Through her ministry. Through her ministry. That's her unique gift. What? Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. What is it? What is it, the unique gift that God made in you? Why do you laugh at corny things that you laugh at, cry at the things that you cry at? What is it about the shape and the design of you that God had in his mind in eternity past? Before any of the problems of your life existed, God had a purpose and a destiny for you. The devil is deathly afraid. Do you realize that half the struggles that you have in your life right now are not even about you? They didn't hear what I said. I said half the struggles that you have in your life are not even about you. They're about you never getting to the place where you serve and release all that God has for you that would touch the world around you. He wants to contain and block that so that people never get set free. The greatest joy you will ever have. I, w I wish you could see me this afternoon because around noon, 1.30, when I'm dead tired from sweating and preaching all morning, I'm going to sit down and do like this. <sighs> Doesn't get any better than this. You know why? Because I would have done what God created me to do. I didn't even know it. I didn't even know it was what God wanted for me. I had no idea. I joined the Marine Corps looking for a cause and a purpose, and God began to move me along a pathway that allowed me to discover the first step, say discover. Why, why do I need to get discipled? Why do I need to get an uncomplicated discipleship? Why do I need to be in a small group? Why do I need to serve on a ministry team? All of that positions you so that you might begin to discover what God had in mind for you. And you only discover that by getting in motion. Anybody ever had your car break down or get a flat tire? I had my car break. I used to, man, when we were broke, I had these busted cars for some reason. And they kept breaking down. And I noticed something. You can't stir the car until it gets into motion. You get three or four people behind it pushing. Isn't it right, bro? All of a sudden, that stirring wheel loosen up a little bit. You're like, keep pushing, bro. And, 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 and you can move the car. Maybe God can't stir you to your destiny because you're still sitting in church immobilized. Maybe if you just got up and did something. What, what's the problem? Why can't every one of you serve one Sunday a month? Amen. Serve and make the church better. Serve and contribute and give something back for all that the ministry has given you. I couldn't even think, listen, when I first got saved, I was in the Marine Corps. And, um, I, you know, Marines, we got to be active. We got to do something, you know. We need a water fight. We got to have something to do. And I was coming to church every week, and I was like, man, it's got to be more than just sitting in church, right? Like, just sitting in church listening to the guy preach. It's like, I want to be a part of it. It was changing my marriage. It was changing my life. And so I saw this guy one Sunday. He was like a five-foot Latino guy, and he had a stack of, like, 12 chairs. And he was stacking these chairs because they were going to vacuum and clean the sanctuary. I had no idea what an usher was. I didn't know what a ministry team was. I was just in the church, happy to be saved. And I asked the guy one Sunday, he was sweating, y'all. You know what I'm saying? He had, a, he had taken off his shirt. He had a white beat on. He was all tatted down with L.A. signs on his neck and stuff. But he had gotten saved. He was a drug addict. He had gone. He had been held down in jail for like 10 years. And he got out, and he was serving. And I went to him. I said, hey, bro, you need some help? He was like, yeah. <laughs> it was like 800 chairs. So every week, that's where I started. I started stacking chairs and we were vacuuming. And I want you to know that because I was in the Marine Corps, those were the straightest rows in any church ever. Those chairs were straight. You understand what I'm saying? Then they moved me to the bathroom. And the bathroom, I didn't know y'all, ladies, I didn't know. The bathroom was next to the nursery. In the Marine Corps, we cleaned the bathroom with pine saw and bleach. Um, that creates a toxic cloud, hello? That really wasn't helpful for the nursery, you know what I'm saying? So I got fired from my second ministry job. They were like, yeah, we don't want you to do that anymore. Don't clean anymore. It was a clean bathroom. You would be pleased with my bathrooms. <laughs> and it was all about being doing what was available and what was needed. And God was seeing faithfulness in my heart 
and in my life. I, they challenge me to be on time and stuff like that. Oh, geez, let me find something you like. Some of y'all punctuality challenge. Let me just go ahead and... So, so then these gifts, say gifts. Yes. Romans 12 and 4 says this. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, this body, this body, Freedom Church, each part has a special function. Can I ask you, what is your special function? Look at me. Each of you has a special function in this body. God called you into this body, so each of you has a special function. What is your function in this body? You are not just an attender. You are not just somebody that writes a check. What is your function? What is it that you release that God has deposited, that God has empowered you to do? I, I tell you right now, I'm so grateful for the team that I have in Oregon. Because I, my grandmother raised me pretty much. Because my, grand, my mom was 16, I told you. So my grandmother raised me, my great-grandmother, and I loved her. And she died in my arms in the, in the hospital. And so I always struggle to go to the hospital. I thank God for the ministry team that I have in my church because I get there and I do it because I'm a pastor and people call for their pastor. But I'm awkward and I'm anxious and I don't, never feel good in a hospital because it's where several people in my life died and I was there and it was tragic. But I got people in my church that they love it. It's their gift. They go to sit in the ICU with people. They get coffee and they pray with families with people that are dying or people that had tragic accidents and different things happen to them. And they go and do that stuff. I don't do that. They do it. It's their gift. I got people, watch this. Nobody thinks that I can manage anything. And that's right, because I don't. I'm a visionary. I'm not a manager. And, but I thank God for the people that get the budgets together and do all the administration. And I thank God for the facilities people and all of the people that have all these different gifts that they've discovered and deposit them at East Hill. Now, the challenge is, is the devil wants you to keep wearing the labels and the tags and the things associated with your past. He keeps wanting you to see yourself as a victim and not useful and always in need of somebody coming to help you and somebody to come encourage you. And I'm trying to tell you that God has called you to be an encouragement to somebody. Yeah. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. He's called you to release your gift so that the ministry of Freedom Church can go forward, not just from here, but in other surrounding cities. I don't know if you noticed, but L.A. is in trouble. Oh, y'all not talking to me. I this mic at you. I said, L.A. is in trouble. What is the answer? We're going to vote it in? No. We're going to vote it in, but you should participate in the process. But we don't place our faith ultimately in elected leaders. We place our faith in the king of kings and what he can do. And what he wants to do is put his hand on you and send you to be the solution. Listen, I can tell you right now, if you sit here another year, you're going to be frustrated and you'll leave this church and go to another church. Frustrated with that church, go leave another church. Frustrated with that church. And, and here's the problem. Every time you come to a church, it has no hope of ever being perfect. Because you're imperfect and everybody else in the building is too. And so what do we do? We lend our gift and help do what we can with the grace on our life. Aren't you glad that I didn't sing? I preach. I don't sing. Because if I do sing, but it ain't a gift. Come on, somebody. It's not a gift to you. It's a gift to me, and the Lord loves it. <laughs> but it ain't good. But they are gifted and graced. And, and because, watch this, and because they release their grace, we're encouraged. We enter the presence of God through their grace. But it's the same thing. I don't know about you, but I like coming to church and getting a donut or two. I don't know who got the donut wall ministry, but I like that ministry a lot. <laughs> Everybody's grace connected to the body forms this beautiful thing. It's like this mosaic, all of the broken pieces. You're like, but I'm broken. Join the club. We're all broken. And we're all in need of God's grace. And God calls us sons and daughters. He calls us loved. He calls us adopted. He calls us forgiven. He loves you and wants to use you today. Yeah. Only challenge is, is the devil is blocking you, trying to contain you with busyness and lesser pursuits and all this other stuff, and you never get to the point of your assignment. And then some of you, how many of you in here know your gift? Lift your hands right now. You know what it is. Okay, put your hand down. Some of you have a gift too but it's buried like in Matthew chapter 25, and I'm closing. It's like in Matthew 25. 
You know what your gift is. You know what your talents, the parable of the talents. The, the king left and gave five talents, two talents, one talent. Two of them invested those talents, cultivated them, multiplied them, used them. The other one was afraid. Say afraid. afraid. Say afraid. afraid. The other one was afraid, and the Bible says he buried his talent. Some of the best talents in Freedom Church are buried in fear. Fear of rejection. Fear that whatever it is, just name your fear. And you won't use your gift. And I'm here to tell you, listen to me for a minute. I'm here to tell you that that, is not, that will not be an excuse for you before the Lord when you stand before him and you have to give an account for your gifts. Fear won't be a good excuse because he'll say, why didn't you trust me? Why, why didn't you trust me? Why didn't you, why didn't you walk in faith? Why didn't you, I've been faithful. How many can look over your shoulder right now and know that God has been faithful? Look back over your life and you made it through every challenge. So we're without excuse. The same grace that brought you through that is the same grace that God wants to release as you release your gifts. We got people in here that have graphic design gifts, design gifts, all types of gifts. This church ought to be the best church in Chatsworth, in the valley. Right? It, but it can't be until the body comes together. I close with this. How many, how many got small kids and daughters in particular that, that, that they want like houses and stuff built on Christmas Eve and all of the toys? This used to be the bane of my existence when I read a box that says some assembly required. <laughs> like I want to just open the box. I don't want that uh, some assembly. Come on, Justice. So, so then it becomes like this. You have to assemble to form the body that God called Freedom Church to be. It's not just, because here's the deal. All of the parts, parts are in the box, right? All the parts are in the box. They're just not assembled to make anything until the Lord assembles us together as his body. Every gift, watch this, every gift being used for his glory. Come on, give the Lord a big hand clap right now. Come on, like you really mean it. Come on, so look, here's two. Here's two action steps. I'm going to turn it to your pastor. He's going to close. Two action steps. If you've never gotten involved in the discipleship pathway here, uncomplicated discipleship, you need to do it. And I'm not just saying it because he's standing here. I'm saying it because I lived it. When I got out of the seat and moved closer into the center of the church, that's when I started being positioned to hear, discover, and develop, and then ultimately deploy what God had called me to do before I ever had a challenge in my life. So that's one. Second, get on a ministry team. You should do it today. Don't leave. Why? Because it gets me next to people where I begin to explore and my faith. Where do you learn long suffering? When I got to suffer along with somebody. Where do you learn gentleness and kindness and all of the fruit of the spirit? When you're working next to people and you have to practice and demonstrate. Come on, y'all. Talk to me. And watch this. Your life makes no sense until you give it to the Lord so that he can use it. Amen? Give the Lord a big hand clap right now. Can we thank Pastor Keith? Hey, will you stand to your feet? We're going to dismiss here in like 90 seconds, all right? Um, are you glad you came to church today? Here's what I know about being a preacher. is We're not preaching every week to inspire or just to motivate or even just so that you learn something new. Because you know, a lot of us, we've already learned enough in the Bible already that we haven't applied yet. So we really don't need to learn anything new. <laughs> we just need to apply what God's already told us. I know that when Pastor Keith comes out here or when I hold this microphone, we're not preaching to your Sunday. We're preaching to your Monday. You have a great call and a great purpose for your life. And do not make the mistake today. Can I pass you for a second? Of leaving motivated, but not putting into action what God has put on your heart. So I want to give you two things to put into action, and Pastor Keith just said it. Number one is our discipleship group that we're doing. We got three weeks, I think, left, and the easiest way is to go right out of this service into that room. Somebody walked into the foyer today, and they, they looked at me, and they said, I have all sorts of questions about Jesus. And I looked at them, and I went like this, and I pointed to the, the room. And she's like, ah, you know, it's like, you don't want to go to church after church. But can I tell you, 45 minutes in that, you're going to be able to ask questions. And more importantly than even that, you're going to get to know Richard and Vanessa. Will you, will you wave your hand, Vanessa? She, she's the one who runs everything around here. She has the gift of helping you discover your gift. When you go to church and you've been seeing yourself the same way all the time, looking in the mirror, you see your past, you see your struggles, you see your addictions, you see, you see the old you. But then you go to church and God puts you around the right people 
And one of the great gifts of the body of Christ is we get to see who you are in Christ. And so you being here today, you're around the kind of people that are gonna help you grow. So go to that discipleship class. There's three weeks left and figure out how you can be a part of the body of Christ here. You're gonna need somebody else to see something in you that maybe you can't see for yourself. Does that make sense? I was getting in the shower the other day. Don't think about it too much, but I was getting in the shower the other day. And uh, I was gonna go to lead a staff meeting here. And, um, and I said, okay, Lord, and I was praying. Anybody else pray in the shower or am I the only one? I pray better just in the shower. Anybody else? I don't know what it is. And I'm praying and I said, Lord, I'm gonna lead the staff today. And I said, I, I have the best leaders in our church gathered what do you want me to say to them? And the Holy Spirit said, clear as day. He goes, how do you know those are the best leaders in your church? Wow. And so I would submit this to you. There's some people here who have a lot to offer. I bet you there are some incredible leaders, some incredible mentors in our junior high department, some incredible mentors in our kids department, some incredible future church planters and life group leaders and anything else that you, this, this church needs, but you just haven't seen it in yourself yet. So I'm gonna give you this last action step. I want you to text this number team to that number because not this Friday, but next Friday. Turn to the person next to you say next Friday. We have a team night where we bring everybody together and everybody who's already on teams, we're celebrating, but also we bring new people onto the team so that you can find a way to plug in. Pastor Keith talked about the first thing he ever did was stacking chairs. The first thing I ever did was help teach nine junior hires in the junior high department. Then I got promoted to vacuuming the church. And then I got promoted to cleaning the bathrooms. And I got fired for cleaning the bathrooms too, but not because I was doing a good job. Uh, <laughs> will you please get in the game? Will you please see, not let, the, not let the enemy block you or detain you, but let Jesus deploy you into the great work that he's already prepared for you to do, Ephesians chapter 10. Get in the game, get in the game. Man, people out there praying for a sign and praying for an answer to prayer. And don't you know God wants to answer that and guide them through your life? Would you bow your head, would you close your eyes? If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, this is your moment. You heard the gospel today. You heard about a God who loves you so much that he gave his life for you. And here you are saying, how do I have a new fresh start? Well, you have to admit that your life hasn't made sense till now. You have to die so that you can live. Jesus died for you, he rose for you, he gives you new life, but you have to admit, I need a savior. So if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, in the, in the, in the intimacy of this room, I'm not gonna embarrass you, I'm not gonna call you in the front, I'm not gonna like single you out, but you are here today and need to say, today is the day that I am gonna follow Jesus. I'm no longer gonna live a life about myself. I'm no longer gonna let my sin hang me up. I'm gonna receive the forgiveness of God and move into the new life that he has for you. If you wanna be forgiven today and set loose on a great future that he has for you, would you have the courage to raise your hand just to say, I need a savior. Just stick your hand straight up to say, I need a savior. Just stick your hand straight up to say it. I see hands going up around the room and just say it. I need a savior. Just say, I need a savior. Just say it out loud. I need a savior. And we're with you and we're with you and we're with you and we're with you and we're with you. Come on, anybody else? We're with you and we're with you. Anybody else? Let's thank Jesus for people giving their, their life to him today. And the rest of you,